for the tools that we learn, it shouldn't make sense why we cannot be financially independent. It doesn't have to be at 25 years old, but at 40, 45, or even 50 years old. We have all the right tools for it. Hi, David. So thanks so much for being here today. So I'm really excited to hear about your journey because like, I don't think you have the typical uh, journey of an actuary. So I'm sure like myself and our viewers will be really excited to hear about yours. So first, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, no problem. And uh, thank you, V, for inviting me to this uh, interview. I guess if people want to know the context of where I started and where I am today, uh, I have to go briefly talk about a bit about my parents' story. So you see, my parents are Chinese, but they were born in Vietnam. And uh, during the Vietnam War, they had to flee Vietnam, leaving everything behind. Uh, and of course, they were what we know today as the boat people. Uh, and after staying two years as a, in a refugee camp in Hong Kong, they decided to immigrate to Canada, where I was born and raised. Uh, but, you know, my dad was a dentist, but it wasn't recognized uh, here in Quebec and Montreal. So he ended up working three jobs to make ends meet. He was a kitchen cleaner during the daytime. He was a waiter at a restaurant during night and weekends. And he took vacations to work. He took basically the two, three weeks of vacation he had to do to file income taxes for his clients. And my mom on her side, she worked in the textile industry like a lot of the Asian mothers that came here to Canada uh, and taking care of both my sisters and myself. So since we were, since our youth, there were really a lot of values that were instilled in us, which is like working hard and education. Education was really important. And I mean, we all know the typical stereotypes of Asian parents. They all want us to be doctors, dentists, or pharmacists. And God knows there's a lot of Vietnamese that do this, <laughs> or Chinese people who, who are. And unfortunately, none of my sisters nor myself, we, are, we became doctors, pharmacists, or uh, dentists. Uh, and this especially even more true because my dad was a dentist, my grandfather and my uncle were dentists. So it kind of ran in the family. But you should have seen my dad's reaction when I told him, oh, I want to become an actuary. And he was like, what? Because back then in 2005, uh, 2005 when I joined, uh, like I applied to become an actuary, it wasn't known. Like people were mistaking, oh, actuary, is that an actor? Are you acting? Is that obituary? Are you dealing with dead people? And plus when I, when I tried to explain, it's like things related to insurance, life insurance, they're like, oh, it's obituary? Like do you deal with dead people? And some of them mix, mistake it with accounting. <laughs> oh, so you, you're becoming an accountant. So it was really difficult for me to explain. And the other thing is I did have my grades to become, to get in medicine, but I was afraid of blood. <laughs> so I, I had some convincing that I had to do, like, you know, okay, I want to become an actuary. And the actuarial profession really matched my personality well, because it was a combination of mathematics, which was a field that I was strong in. Uh, it was a combination of finance, which I really liked and enjoyed uh, working on and a combination of programming and uh, computer uh, sciences. And that I had a passion as well, because like a lot of teenage boys, we had a phase where we were like uh, playing video games, playing PC games. So I had that same phase. Uh, back then I was playing a lot of video games and I started coding too. Uh, and so when I saw, oh, the actual profession merge maths, finance and programming, I was like, oh, that's perfect for me. And so I chose the route of working as an actuary. After graduation, uh, I worked two years in asset management. Uh, I did go, had a chance to go to Paris to work and Toronto to work as well. And then I worked 10 years in the property and casualty field. Uh, so my last uh, position, I was uh, managing two teams, one team in Toronto, one team in Montreal, and the data analytics team. So we had people starting to uh, code in Python, do AI, and basically we had to create the analytics for different departments that uh, they were working with us. And last June of last year, uh, I, I made a decision to retire from my nine to five career uh, as an actuary and entirely focus 100% to my real estate uh, uh, investing firm that I co-founded with my partners. And uh, so I, that's pretty much the journey. Uh, I went to, I was, I was working as an actuary for, I guess, 
12 to 13 years and then uh, retired early last year. But I mean, we say retire, but it's more we've attained financial independence. We don't require that salary to live, but we will never retire. <laughs> like we, mm -hmm. we have to keep ourselves busy working on different projects. And uh, in my case, it's uh, real estate investment uh, is my project. Yeah, really nice. And I would say like, I resonate a lot with your story, especially about like me also growing up uh, and I'm from Vietnam originally, right? So like the education, the explanation of why you want to go into the actuary, I went through the same thing because my parents had the same reaction what you want to study math what are you gonna do with a math career yeah like they didn't know what it is and to be honest until this day I still don't know if my parents understood uh, what we are doing as an actuary so yeah so yeah that's a completely different topic like to your point at the end of the day it's not that they want us to be doctors or pharmacists or dentists they just want us to have you know a stable job mm -hmm. and uh and be happy and to be able to to live happily and healthily so yeah for sure yeah and uh so i think the other day i saw a post a linking post uh from you about like your journey on the resume versus your journey in real life and that was like really insightful and that was really great to see and so yeah so can you tell us more about like that journey, how did you go from like working as an actuary into um, doing what you're doing right now in the real estate? Yes, of course. So the way I see it is I'm still doing actuarial work. Because if you think about what actuaries do, it's really using data and using analytics to solve problems. And another thing that's really important I find is not just working with the data, but also understanding the data and being able to interpret those data. So I am still doing all those things that we've learned as uh, an actuary, except it's not in the industry of uh, like traditional industries like life insurance or PNC insurance, but in a more unconventional industry, which is real estate that doesn't have that many uh, actuaries. I would say the differences is I mean, we've worked, we've worked in, in, in uh, more conventional fields and uh, for bigger corporations. And our day-to-day -day jobs, what we do is we really help the insurer or the company get that extra 0.01% in closing ratio or try to reduce 1%, 2% in uh, underwriting costs or expenses to compete with other insurers or other companies that have also a team of actuaries. And also fighting for that extra 0 0.1. And the tools that we learn is we use GLM. Now we use machine learning and uh, we use big data. We have access to big data. We try to merge with external data. And we use all these methods to get that 0 0.1. And when I was working in asset management, it's the same thing. We're working, like we're helping companies to invest their pension funds. And we're trying to get that extra 1%, 2% alpha, which is added value to their annual return. And if we achieve this, then, you know, basically that's, that's our job. And we get uh, bonuses and, and so on and so forth. Now, in unconventional industries, for example, we are a state where there are not that many actuaries. Once we use those tools and we go into unconventional industries, the impact that we can create is much bigger. Because if you think about it, why are we f working like, with a lot of experts and everything and a lot of uh, technologies to get that extra 0.1 is because the market is efficient. And what I mean by market is efficient, it is the efficient market theory that we've learned at school. It means it needs to be very liquid. It needs to have low transaction costs. Uh, all the information is public. So we're helping you know, the, the stock market or uh, insurance data, those kind of things. We're playing with bit data and the market is very efficient and we're trying to compete for that point one. Real estate is the complete opposite. It is a very inefficient market. Transaction costs are huge. It takes weeks to months to close a property. So it's, it is not liquid and information is not very available to the public. It, it, there's a lot of inside information and that's how real estate works. So the impact that an actuary can create in unconventional uh, industries 
is big. And that's when I decided to make the jump because I'm like, oh, I can help even more people uh, with the tools that I learned. Those are very valid points and very great points. And that's, I think that's exactly what we in the actual professions want to uh, head towards or make, make a statement as well that the actual profession, we are not just employee or like can be helpful in the conventional industry, like the insurance or the risk or the finance, but we can also add value in a lot of other industries as well. And and so, yeah, so I think like that, this is another case of like where the actuaries can help add value and can be employed or great or have our own business <laughs> in that sense. Yeah. So can you uh so can you tell us a little bit more about like maybe how's your day or week look like working for yes. your own firm? Yes, so uh it is an excellent question. And I actually do write uh quite often every week and uh LinkedIn or in Twitter. So uh like if your audience is uh they're interested in learning more about the details of what I do as uh as vice president or as co-founder and the, my real estate private equity firm, then they can uh, follow me on LinkedIn or on Twitter. Uh, and then, but if I, if I can talk about what's a typical day or a typical week, working in a real estate private equity firm, there are basically, I would say you can divide it in four different responsibilities. Okay. And the first one is acquisition. Uh, so you basically need to analyze the market, you need to uh, search for and find the rare gem or buy a good property at, uh, at a price that makes sense, that generate enough uh, return on investment for yourself or for your investors. Whoever's in charge of this position needs to be well connected in the real estate industry. Uh, they need to be to know to have a good eye for details and to be able to spot opportunities. And also they need to know how to negotiate. OK, so once we have that property, once we found that property, we need the capital, right, to buy to buy the property, and that would be the second responsibility. This person needs to raise the capital among investors, uh, accredited investors, and then they need to be also an, to be an excellent communicator to be able to explain to the investors uh, how they will be making money, basically, how what are the returns, and also explain the different risk that exists in real estate because we have to be transparent about it and be able to explain to the investors how us as co-founders, as general partners, how we work in mitigating those risks. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, making money is what attracts them, but managing risk is what keeps them also uh, in our funds. So once we have found the property, we've raised the financing, we've purchased the property, the third responsibility is operations because we don't just buy and leave it there. We have to manage the tenants. We have to manage the property, do maintenance, uh, manage the professionals. So for example, plumbers, electricians, uh, find different ways to optimize it, to add value. Uh, and so all those, you know, getting your hands dirty, basically that's what it means, the operations. And the fourth responsibility, uh, which is uh, the last one, but not the least, it is everything related to the legal structure and the tax structure, because if I was to ask you a question, what is the biggest expense of most people in their life, do you think? Well, because you say tax, then <laughs> that, <laughs> yes. will, that will be my answer. So, <laughs> That's probably true when we sign mortgage at one point. <laughs> yes. So, so, of course, there was that hint. But most people would answer house, right? And house is not your biggest expense. It is taxes. At the end of the day, it's not how much you make that's the most important. It is how much you keep after tax that's the most important. So the fourth responsibility is always finding you know, ways to optimize. And in real estate, there are actually many ways to optimize and to be tax efficient. Uh, that's also why we have never sold any of our buildings. We just buy, optimize, we hold them, and we refinance. And this allows us to recycle the funds to be able to purchase more properties without our investors or ourselves to we inject more money to buy more properties. We just roll our portfolio this way. And so I've talked about the four responsibilities. And in our firm, 
each of us generable partner, we can do all these four. Obviously, we have a nature that's like I'm towards more operations. My partner is towards more financing. And we have these things. But each of us can do any of these four. So a normal day would depend on which phase we are at. Uh, are we at buying phase? So maybe we're, at, we're using those uh, acquisition skills that we have. We're looking at the numbers. We're, we're trying to explore. We put it in our underwriting model using Excel, using macros, VPA, uh, things that we've learned as an actuary. And then we can, you know, uh, in a way, analyze hundreds of different properties and then cut the, filter them down to, like, let's say, 10 properties that we really like. And then, again, try to dig more, see what we can optimize, what makes sense, and then start to negotiate with the seller and so on and so forth. Are we in a different phase? Are we raising capital? So it always varies in a, a typical day among those four responsibilities. I would say like very interesting like things and but then also like difficult as well. But yeah, I, I like your statement about like uh, investor there to make a profit like to like that's how they get started. But to keep them is like on about like managing the risk and stuff. And that's exactly like the job of an actuary. Like we supposed to be like an expert in managing risk. Mm -hmm. So like you make another very great point about like how relevant the actual profession in the real estate. And I'm sure that is for a lot of other industry as well. So in, in here, I can see that like when you're telling about your, your work and your responsibility and everything, there's a lot of hands-on aspect. And I think that also comes with being an entrepreneur working for your own business, for your own farm. So can you tell us more about like maybe what are the biggest challenges uh, for you being an entrepreneur? I think the biggest challenge is really like especially for an actuary to become an entrepreneur is to have the right sets of expectations. So you see, I was always open about what I did. Like even when I was working at the insurance firm, I had side businesses too. I, I mean, I had my real estate investment as well. And I was always open about it. And that fact made it my colleagues and, and VPs and also uh, my uh, employees, they were they were more open and they, they actually reached out to me and talked about it. And what I realized is a third of them also has asked the question of, oh, should I become an entrepreneur? Should, uh, like I have interest in be, like opening my own business or uh, doing my own tech venture, you know, opening my own tech startup. And then when I asked them, what are the top three reasons why they want to become an entrepreneur? Most of the answers is making a lot of money. Uh, working like flexible time, working whenever I want, like being at a beach whatsoever. And the third is not having a boss, being my own boss. And I'm like, e. <laughs> first of all, if you become an entrepreneur, uh, the majority of them, you know, don't make money and close their business after five years. And for those who do make money, they make just enough to replace their salaries, not significantly more. If it's to have flexible hours uh, in the first three to five years, it's not a nine to five. I mean, sure, actuaries, we do work overtime and whatsoever, so it's a bit more than nine to five. But when you're an entrepreneur and you think about your business, it's 24 seven. You always have to worry about everything. Uh, while I'm eating with my wife, I have to think about other things too. And, and oh, what's gonna happen if someone calls me for this and for that? And we get phone calls, like we, we have to answer them. Of course, we can delay it a bit, but we have to be prompt and active, reactive. And then being our own boss. Sure, we won't have a manager or a director uh, on top of us or a VP on top of us. But when you're an entrepreneur, everyone else is your boss. Your clients is your boss. Your suppliers are, is your boss. Your, your landlord, if you're renting a, uh, a place for your business, is your boss. Uh, your investors is your boss. So it's worse. <laughs> so those three like reasons shouldn't be the top reasons. If they go in with those expectations, they will be like quickly disappointed. And once you're disappointed, you lose your motivations and your inspiration to, to continue being an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is really one thing to solve problems. I mean, and that's how you get paid too. You solve problems and you create value for people. So what I see with entrepreneur is people who likes to own the projects, right? To do something from A to Z. 
uh, because that's what you do uh, when you're an entrepreneur versus when you're working in a big company. Like, you know, a lot of the Excel templates already exist. You don't create something from scratch. You just go, you modify some stuff. A lot of the programs already exist. But when you're an entrepreneur, you create everything from A to Z. Uh, when I was in operations for my real estate private equity firm, I went to unclog toilets that were blocked. I went to unlock a door when the tenant forgot his key. I did everything to learn. But once I've learned, I'm like, okay, I can delegate. Because now I know how it works and everything. So when I hire someone to go and clog the toilet, I know if I will get cheated or not. Because if the person says, oh, it took me three hours, they're charging me three hours. I'm like, no, it should take you 30 minutes because I've done that before. I'm not a pro. So if anything, you should take less time than I do. And so you have to get your hands dirty. And that's what entrepreneurs do. They do A to Z, they learn everything. And then they start to delegate once they, their business grow and they start their scaling. And uh, that's what we have to go to. They have the passion to, to help people, to create value for people, uh, to solve problems. And that's really what the expectations should be. Focus on solving problems for people and then the money will come. Don't focus on the money. And once you, you learn all about the A to Z, then you would start being able to scale, to go on the beach and have flexible time. But in the first five years, it's not like this. It, it takes time. So the expectations, expectations need to be set right. I totally agree because like I, uh, my, my husband and I also have a side business in photography. Well, wedding photography yeah like definitely when you say about like everyone is your boss totally <laughs> relatable <laughs> because if it's just uh, potential clients or current uh, clients like asking you questions tough questions sometimes like being in customer service handling all of that it's not fun and it's really like when you are like just starting up right like you're going to be the one that's doing the majority of the things. So you have to know everything. And it's not like you can come to somebody else and like, hey, you deal with that. No, you are the one dealing with that in 24-7 too. Yeah, yeah. So totally relatable. But in a way, it's also higher risk and potential higher return. That's, that's where people are starting with the entrepreneur. But totally agree with you. Like, that's not how people should start it at the beginning like you have to have a passion you have to like what you do and eventually hopefully the rewards will come there's no guarantee though <laughs> yeah and, and i like what you just uh mentioned a keyword that you mentioned higher risk higher return right so that's something very interesting because we as actuaries we understand risk well so is risk actually higher First of all, it's a calculated risk. And a lot of times, I don't know, like, I talk with a lot of actuaries because obviously I was in the industry and I, a lot of my friends are actuaries. A lot of them are actually very risk averse. And to me, it doesn't make sense <laughs> because to be an actuary, you need to love risk, not be afraid of risk. And you need to love risk to be able to manage it, right? And so a lot of the, like a lot of people ask me, like actors ask me, oh, how, how did I, you know, reach uh, the success I had in real estate? How did I do those kind of things? And I'm like, anyone can do it. How, how can you not? Because if anything, real estate maths is 10 times easier than actuarial maths. So if I have like a uh, 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 real estate advice or finance advice for them, I would say, you know, look at your past. <laughs> You've been studying 200, 300 hours for every exam for I don't know how many years. Like we have what, nine, 10 exams. I know it changed every year, but <laughs> we're doing two, 300 hours every year for nine, 10 years. It's, it's like a, med a medical program. <laughs> And we're, we're used to it. We're not afraid of those books, right? Of all those the study ma manuals and everything. But then when we talk about mortgage, when we talk about real estate or personal finance, it's, the book is much smaller. It takes less than 100 hours to master it. And the math is much simpler. But they're afraid of making that jump. 
And a lot of things is related to how we work also in a corporate company and making that jump to become an entrepreneur. Because in a corporate company, all those templates already exist, right? Uh, if I start as an intern or I start as a junior analyst, the programs have been already created. I just need to tweak some variables, tweak some things, and see if it still correlates with the, the, the numbers that we want. Uh, we run the models, those kind of things. But it shouldn't be like this. Break that. We, like I always tell my employees when I was working as a manager, break that model, you know, create something from scratch because I need them to understand. Once they understand risk, they can manage it better. If they just tweak some things, they will never understand. Like, sure, we, we learn about liquidity risk. We talked about uh, all sort of like a political risk, uh, legal risk, but do we truly understand it? We won't understand it if we start trying to sell a stock ourselves. Oh, it takes two seconds and sold. Okay, if we try to sell a more illiquid stock, oh, it's that it takes uh, a few hours. Then you start to worry, right? The emotions start to set in. When you start selling or buying a house, then you see, how come it's so long? Like I'm trying to book a notary and it's taking two, three weeks. I'm trying to get an inspector and there are financing condition I have to respect. Now, now the emotion side of it uh, goes in. So we learn about those things, but we never lived it. But once you live it, then you understand what is truly liquidity risk. Emotion sets in, you start to worry and you start to make irrational decisions. There's that liquidity risk too. It's not just, oh, it takes more time to sell. You start to have fear and you start want to sell at a lower price because it's taking too long and you start to uh, not control it well. So I would recommend them to actually love risk and so that they can control their emotions better and so that they become better at, at finance, personal finance and whatsoever. Because for the tools that we learn, it shouldn't make sense why we cannot be financial independent it doesn't have to be at 35 years old, but at 40, 45, or even 50 years old. We have all the right tools for it. Those are great. Yeah. And I think fi financial independence has become like a very relevant topic and for like uh, people, well, for the people at the younger, uh, younger age and younger generations, and we're striving for it. And I would say like, I agree with you. We have all of the means and on uh, on the relevant tunes and like even like in a way intellectual to be able to achieve it as well. But whether we actually want to put a mind into it, actually like work on that path, right? Is that something that we want to achieve? And if if we want to pursue it, I'm sure we can do it. Yeah. And I I know I opened a big bracket. Like coming back to the the keywords that you mentioned: high risk, high return. So it's actually lower risk because the tools that we've learned can, like we've studied hundreds of thousands of hours on actual mathematics, but financial maths, it's our realistic maths is much simpler. So it's technically lower risk, right? Because we have stronger tools and it's high return. Uh, something that I've mentioned earlier in uh, one of your first two questions is the impact that we have in unconventional industries is actually greater because they don't necessarily have access to those kind of tools. Uh, like, you know, I, I, I taught my sister how to use Excel for different things. And my sister, she's a head nurse at a hospital and something really easy, but nurses, not a lot of nurses use Excel, but when she was able to use Excel, she's like, wow, the impact that's, that has helped her and her, you know, clients, her patients, not clients, uh, her patients, uh, it's great, it's uh, phenomenal. So. Risk is actually lower and return is bigger. We just need to see it. I think in this one, you actually get to a point that the inherent risk at the beginning actually large. But because we are actually, we have the tool, we have the way to manage it, then the residual risk for us actually are smaller. So that is like, I think the key difference where we, we some we somehow being able to manage the risk to make it go from high inherent risk to low residual risk. To yeah. your point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So thanks so much for being here again and like uh, for sharing all of your insight and knowledge. Yeah. Um, I wish you like all of the success into in your entrepreneur journey and then living your life to the fullest. Thank you very much. And uh, likewise, I mean, you are also doing something very unconventional. And, uh, and it's 
amazing what you're doing because it's it's having a phenomenal reach to to people that wants to become an actuaries or dire actuaries. So uh, what you're doing, like, you know, best of luck and your future projects as well. And uh, thank you for uh, inviting me for this interview. Thank you.